In this episode of Shaping the Future, I'm speaking with the glaciologist, Dr. Heidi Silvestre, about the changing state of the Arctic, the outlook for Russian chairmanship of the Arctic Council, of which Heidi herself is an advisor, and how thawing permafrost could be past the threshold of irreversibility. Heidi combines the spirit of the modern polar explorer with the weight of her important scientific work. She is also an excellent communicator and will be speaking at the Change Now Climate Summit later this month in the company of Sir David Attenborough and world-renowned scientist Johan Rockström, who will be premiering their new documentary, Breaking Boundaries, as part of the virtual summit. Heidi also gives her perspective on why we literally must fight hard to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius giving a rare insight into how someone who wanted to be a glaciologist from a very young age actually feels about the rate of loss of the world's glaciers. Thank you for listening to Shaping the Future. Please subscribe and share the podcast as we have many more episodes on the way, exploring the change needed to avert the worst impacts of climate change. Heidi. It's good to speak to you. Thank you very much for taking the time. I see that you've been working up in the Arctic recently. Can you just tell us what you've been doing up there, what you've been looking at? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm just back from uh, a month-long expedition on the archipelago of Svalbard. Our goal was to do an expedition that is completely different from the more classical expedition. We wanted to show that we can reduce our cardboard footprint Hence, we spent a month skiing, pulling all our research equipment behind us, investigating the deposition of black carbon on snow and ice on the archipelago of Svalbard. It definitely was extremely hard work. I think we, we really underestimated how hard it was going to be to not only survive, yeah, but on yeah. top of surviving, still do science along the way. And what we experienced was... Um, pretty disturbing. Um, we decided to do the expedition during the month of April, which is typically, you know, the month during which you have the best weather in Svalbard. It tends to be very stable, cold, but good weather. And the beginning of the expedition was played by the worst storms I've, I've ever had on Svalbard. I've been, wow. I've been going to Svalbard for the past 13 years, and this is a place that I know very well. Svalbard is also um, the epicenter for climate change. It is currently the place on earth that is warming the fastest, six to seven times faster than the rest of the world. And the, the, everything is becoming really disturbed in Svalbard, including the weather. And therefore, at the beginning of the expedition, we just had one storm after another, after another, and we couldn't see an end to it. It was really difficult, but eventually, the weather improved, luckily, and we could uh, finish the expedition safely. Wow, okay. And you just touched on this, this point about the Arctic warming so much faster than everywhere else. And we see it in social media and charts and so on, but you're seeing it firsthand. From your perspective, what does this accelerating heat mean for us, you know, as a, in a more global context? And that's a very good point because for most people, and I completely understand that, the Arctic feels so remote, <laughs> it's so far away from their daily preoccupations. But actually everything that's happening to the Arctic has a direct influence on our daily lives. And we may not thinking about it, but this is true. For example, as, uh, as the Arctic is melting more and more every year, this is increasing sea levels globally. We're also seeing that the Arctic is becoming more accessible. Therefore, there are these shipping routes that are opening up. Um, the access to fossil fuel reserves is also becoming um, easier. And this creates both opportunities and risks globally. Um, and then the last point that is also extremely important, I believe, is the fact that as the Arctic is becoming warmer and warmer every year, this is having a direct impact on the emissions of, of uh, greenhouse gases. So we are seeing these feedbacks that are kicking in, these positive feedbacks that are amplifying the emissions of greenhouse gases. For example, we can look at permafrost. As, as permafrost is thawing more and more, permafrost itself can emit huge amounts of, of greenhouse gases. And this is having an impact globally. So everything that's happening to the Arctic has an importance and has an impact globally. The permafrost sounds like a, a really tricky issue because to stop it, you kind of have to reverse the whole climate trend, which that isn't happening in the short term, that's for sure. Is it a 
significant risk that we can't sort of stop. I mean, we can we can stop our emissions. We hope we will. What's the, your thoughts on the permafrost? I think this is a very important point because we are getting closer and closer to irreversible dynamics. Dynamics, especially when we look at the cryosphere. So all these frozen things on Earth, and, and permafrost is one of them. We are approaching thresholds of irreversibility that that eventually will become um, unstoppable. And permafrost is definitely one of the trickiest ones of all. Permafrost is this sleeping giant where if permafrost starts to thaw, it will start to emit more and more greenhouse gases that in turn will contribute to the warming, uh, contributing to more uh, thawing of the permafrost. And um, it's, it's hard to know if it's already irreversible or not. We've already crossed this threshold, but things are definitely not looking good. And what we do know is that permafrost, for example, if we go beyond two degrees, so if we go into overshoot, if we go beyond the temperature targets of the Paris Agreement, permafrost will emit just as much greenhouse gas emissions as countries, as entire countries. So this will become a very real problem. It already is a very real problem, but it will become increasingly important to tackle emissions for permafrost. So some people argue that because of permafrost, we will have to use other strategies to remove some of these emissions from the atmosphere. Luckily, we have natural systems that have been doing this very well but that are starting to struggle. And some other people um, believe that perhaps using technologies to remove some of this carbon from the atmosphere uh, could also help. Um, so I'm, I'm one of those who um, really argue for trying to reduce emissions from the source. Um, but eventually we will have to go into negative emissions. So using CDR technologies um, to help us because of the fact that permafrost will become such an important player um, in the global carbon budget. One big change about to happen in the Arctic is that Russia is about to take over the chairmanship of the Arctic Council. Now, um, they say they're prioritizing the inhabitants of the Arctic Circle, which is fantastic. What is on your checklist as a policy person, as someone who is working with the Arctic Council? What do you look at and think we need to do this? I think this is a very exciting time uh, to see that uh, Russia is um, is taking over or is is following the um, the Icelandic um, chairmanship of the of the Arctic Council, and it was fantastic to hear. I think it was a couple of days ago Lavrov saying that indeed um, they will prioritize um, the health, um, the living conditions of the people in the Arctic. I mean, we often forget the fact that the, the Arctic as opposed to Antarctica, the Arctic is a place that is fully inhabited. People have been there for more than uh, tens of thousands of years. And, and, um, and so therefore it is a very important topic. And these, these peoples there, they are facing some of the most um, rapid, profound changes that are taking place on earth at the moment because of our actions, because of our emissions. Um, one thing that is um, extremely important to me as a glaciologist and now as, as someone who um, tries to make sure that the science is being understood by, by policymakers and by the general public, what's really important to me is that we fully implement the Paris Agreement. I mean, it is as simple as that. Um, when we look at glaciers, sea ice, um, ice sheets, permafrost, um, when we look at the cryosphere, the cryosphere has a what we call a non-linear response to climate change. So that means that if we go above certain temperature thresholds, especially if we go beyond 1.5 degrees, we will start triggering these irreversible dynamics. For example, the destabilization of the Greenland ice sheet, um, the loss of um, sea ice in the Arctic, especially summer sea ice, uh, the disappearance of mountain glaciers, and these are and also one important point is, is ocean acidification that is becoming major um, in the polar regions. And these dynamics, once we go beyond 1.5 degrees, they are almost impossible to, to stop. We can slow them down, but we can never reverse these kind of dynamics. And one solution to avoid these widespread changes is definitely to fully implement the Paris Agreement. And that means doing whatever we can to keep global temperatures below 1.5 degrees. Yeah, we definitely don't want any of, any of those um, things to happen, especially things like Greenland ocean acidification. 
And yet there was a, I think Potsdam Institute put out a paper this week saying that, you know, we're really reducing our chances now to very few pathways to 1.5. So drastic action has to happen. And pretty much this year, I mean, this is a really critical time. Um, you touched on the opening up of fossil fuel uh, reserves in the Arctic because of melting. And Russia, they sell carbon fossil fuels. And you, we have to have sympathy, I think, for nations who actually their GDP is based on fossil fuels because we're asking them to give them up. And this creates a lot of complexity. Do you see this as a big challenge when we try to sort of transfer away from fossil fuels? Absolutely. I think there's, there's a huge dilemma here. Um, we do know that the warming of the Arctic is creating both opportunities for certain countries and also this comes with a huge amount of risks. Um, today, if there was an oil spill in the Arctic, we're, we're still not able to clean it up. I mean, that's it, it as simple as that. And as uh, we're exploiting reserve or fossil fuel reserves further and further north, um, this is becoming a massive problem. Um, when we look at, for example, an oil spill in contact with sea ice, what can happen is that the oil, oil can actually become sandwiched between um, layers of sea ice. And how, how do you clean this up? Um, sea ice is constantly moving around the Arctic. Um, an oil spill that happens in one place can have impacts you know, all the way across the Arctic. Um, and therefore, the, the notion of governance and of, of risk assessment is absolutely major in the Arctic now. It is, as a scientist, I'm not the one you know, who is supposed to say what we can or cannot do. I can only talk about the risks. So I'm, I'm really curious to see you know, what the Arctic will look like in 10 or 20 years. Things are changing so rapidly, creating, again, both really huge opportunities that, co that come with massive risks. Um, so I really hope that we'll be able to make the right decisions in time and also thinking long term about the consequences of our actions, especially for the people living in the Arctic. OK. Earlier on, you mentioned a word that I've heard more and more recently, which is overshoot. And it's just a reality, basically, that we are in this situation where we might not do enough in time. And in this sort of what I would regard as a worst case scenario, there are scientists saying we should research interventions and like geoengineering. And one reason is cited is to stop or even reverse Arctic heating. What are your thoughts on this subject? Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my opinion, and that's only my opinion, is that I would rather see all these incredibly bright people really thinking more about how can we reduce our emissions at the source? How can we be less dependent on fossil fuels? Instead of thinking about these so-called solutions that, for example, would um, reduce solar, solar input um, onto a region like the Arctic that could have uh, massive consequences. Um, the climate, as you know, is, uh, is a, an extremely complex system. Um, if we start disturbing a little bit of it, um, the consequences could be really far reaching and impacting places where it was not supposed to have an impact on. Um, so, so I think at the moment, the situation is, is so extremely urgent that we do know that the best solution, the most efficient solution is really to reduce emissions at the source. But then I do agree that we will have to look into um, these um, engineering solutions, these geoengineering solutions because of some um, natural feedback such as the, the thawing of permafrost. So there is a huge debate uh, in the scientific community, as you know, and I, I wish we could put just more energy into raising ambitions, into pushing for, for more actions to just simply to reduce emissions at the very source. What's come up a lot in recent interviews is that we don't talk enough about how we feel about these dramatic changes in the climate system. You wanted to be a glaciologist from a young age, and now glaciers are shrinking the world over. How does it make you feel as a human? Yeah, that's a good point. You know, as, as a scientist, you're never supposed to talk about emotions or talk about the way you feel. This should never influence your science, and, and rightly so. Um, but when I see some of the glaciers that I know, like the back of my hands, simply disappearing, it is absolutely heartbreaking. And... Uh, 
And then you have two options. Either you just, you know, just give up and accept everything that's happening, or you just decide to, to fight hard to make sure that this legacy will still be there um, for my children and for their children. Um, so it is, it is terrible, and, and the situation is, is really catastrophic, and I think people should really understand that glaciers are, are melting all over the world, and some of our ma massive ice sheets, the Greenland and the Antarctic ice sheet, are also reacting extremely rapidly uh, to man-made man emissions. So the, the future of glaciers will definitely impact our future, and the two are really tightly related. So we absolutely should do our best to preserve these glaciers because they can influence sea level rise so much because they influence our water resources so much. So let's do our <laughs> utmost to, to try to preserve the cryosphere as much as we can. Okay, well, I've got uh, one more question and I, I think I know pretty much what the answer is going to be. It's a big year for climate with COP26 putting it back on the mainstream media agenda. If you could put your climate policy of choice on the negotiator's agenda, what would it be? <laughs> yeah, I wish I had this, uh, this power, this magic wand to, to make such a big difference. But it would really be to, to help raise ambition and to make sure countries understand the importance of avoiding overshoots um, as much as possible. So let's keep these temperatures below 1.5. Well, thank you very much. It's been great to talk to you and I totally agree with everything you say. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Good luck with everything you're doing this year. It'll be great to catch up with you again soon. Likewise. Thank you so much, Nick. Thanks again for listening. If you are interested to help support this series and help expand the discussion around climate topics, then please do consider backing my channel via Patreon. It will help me produce more content and you will also gain access to more expert interviews. It would be great to engage more with audiences too and understand your views on these topics.